we're going to talk about Seabird today. Um, so a few worksheets that you guys um, have, if you looked at our blog, if you don't have them, again, totally fine. We have worksheet number one that looks like this. We've got worksheet number two. There's two pages. Uh, you can do both. You can do one. It's up to you. Um, they work together. So you can do these two right here. So this is work two. And we've got worksheet three here. You don't really need to print this out at all. Um, you can just look at this online. It's just an, a follow-up activity almost. All right, so let's go. Let's get started about birds in general. So there are over 10,000 species of birds in the world. Um, they are animals, and they are what in the phylum chordata, which means that they have a backbone. Again, guys, they are vertebrates, they have a backbone. Everyone go ahead and feel your spine. Make sure that you have that backbone as well. You guys all do. Um, but they have a backbone. So remember, corals do not have backbones. They are invertebrates. Um, birds are vertebrates. They are in the scientific class called avis. Um, that reminds a little bit of you guys, maybe about the word aviation, so planes. Um, think of it like that. So they're in the class avis, which helps me remember aviation planes. So guys, they have backbones, they have feathers, wings, and they have bills or beaks. Um, we'll call them bills here. They are warm-blooded, they have a very fast metabolism. They lay eggs and they are what we call bipedal, so they have two legs. All right, so let's talk a little bit about their bones. So birds have very thin and hollow bones, um, which makes them very, very light, which is how they're able to fly easier. Uh, some of their bones actually have air sacs, in it, which is connected to their respiratory system. So some of their bones actually have big things of air inside of them. They have a keel-shaped sternum, um, which is where all their flight muscles connect. So their middle bone right here and their chest, um, so like their wishbone. They have a fused collarbone too, that wishbone there. All the muscles meet into the center, and that's where all their strength comes from. So when they fly, all their muscles and strength comes from the center here. They have more neck vertebrate than any other type of animal. So that's pretty impressive for them. That's why they can move their necks around a lot easier than most other animals. Um, they have light toothless beaks, so they do not have teeth. And they have two legs, like I mentioned. All right, so let's talk about their wings. So their wings bend at three joints, kind of like us. They have the wrist joint, the elbow joint, and then the shoulder joint. Um, there are a few types of different kinds of wings here that I will show you. So the first one I'm going to show you guys here, this one here, is called the elliptical wing. So the elliptical wing here um, has small rapid beats that can make sharp turns. So let's think about bats, robins, sparrows, they have elliptical wings, all right? So they have very small um, bursts of speed there and they can make really sharp turns. So they can move really quickly and easily. All right, so your high speed wings right here. All right, so you have your high speed wings right here. They have longer bones and they must be flapped for short glides and descent. So falcons and shorebirds and ducks have the high speed wings. Up here, you have what we call the active soaring wings. So their active soaring ones are long and narrow. So frigate birds and albatrosses, which we're gonna talk about. Um, the active soaring wings are longer and narrow. So they're really good for soaring. Got passive soaring down here which are long and broad. They have actual gaps between the feathers, as you can see. An example is the bald eagle. So those are our main types of wings here. So I bought these top four. Um, that's the main types that we're going to see with different seabirds. So that's something cool to think about as well. All right, so a little bit about their feathers. So their feathers help them fly, obviously. It also keeps them warm. In seabirds, it helps with waterproofing. It helps with coloration. So a lot of land birds actually depend on the color of their feathers to attract a mate. And it also helps them communicate with others. Their feathers are made out of keratin, which is the same as our hair. So guys, feel your hair. It's the same material as what feathers are made out of. Now they have contour feathers, which cover the outside and makes that bird have a smooth appearance. 
they have flight feathers, so they're the larger feathers. Um, your bigger birds have those longer feathers. Those are called flight feathers. And then your birds also have what we call down feathers. Down feathers are on the inside. They're underneath all the other feathers, and it helps trap air in to protect from the heat and from the cold. Um, so you've probably maybe heard of the term down comforter. Um, some pillows have little down feathers in them as well. So that's the smaller inside feathers of these birds that help them regulate their body temperature. So how do birds fly? I get that question quite a bit. Um, so what they do first is they actually use their legs for what we call thrust. And when they use their legs, they're pushing up. And then when they're in the air, they have less pressure pushing on them and they have more pressure pushing up. So that's what actually helps these birds go up and up and up. All right. And once they do that, once the lower pressure is going down and the higher pressure comes up, it creates lift and that's what helps them go up higher. Some birds can actually soar for very long distances um, because they actually utilize the drafts and the clouds and the currents in the atmosphere. So they'll actually hang out in the clouds and use all the breezes in the clouds to help them stay consistent. And we'll talk about a few birds that actually utilize that later on. So let's start talking about seabirds in specific. So there are 350 species of seabirds. And a big difference between them and land birds is that they're not very colorful. Um, they may have a little burst of orange or red, but they usually have counter shading. Counter shading, remember, is what fish can have too. So they're darker on top, lighter on the bottom, so they blend in with the sunlight in the area. Um, but again, seabirds really aren't that colorful. They have more feathers relative to their body size than your land birds. Their feathers are usually waterproof. There is one bird that I will talk about that does not have waterproof feathers. They have webbed feet to help them swim. They also have salt glands near their nostrils to extract salt. So they'll drink salt water a lot. They'll ingest it through eating. And they actually have a process inside their body that will get rid of the salt with these two glands by their nostrils. And that's how they get rid of the salt. All right. They have a diet of mostly fish, squid, and crustaceans. Seabirds also live longer than land birds. Um, so they do live a little bit longer. They are also hardworking parents. So your seabirds actually will spend more time raising their young than land birds do. They'll actually put a lot more effort into making sure that their, their baby bird will survive. They'll spend more time incubating in the nest. Um, so seabirds spend much more time working on their offspring than a land bird would. They possess what we call preen, which is an oil that helps waterproof their feathers. Okay, so let's talk about penguins first. So there are a lot of types of penguins right here. There are 17 species of penguins. They are flightless birds. So guys, penguins cannot fly. They use their wings, they're not wings, but they use them as flippers, so they help them swim. So they don't really have wings, they have flippers, but they are a bird. They cannot fly, but they kind of do fly through the water, so they swim through the water. They spend about half their life in the water itself and half on land, so it's 50-50. The largest species is the emperor penguin. So the largest penguin is the emperor penguin right here. Here's a picture of it. So this is the largest penguin species, and the smallest is the fairy penguin. So it's called the little blue penguin or the fairy penguin. This is the smallest penguin species. All right, so guys, um, penguins live uh, usually in the southern hemisphere. You're not going to find them in the northern hemisphere, and they don't live in the North Pole. Um, so you don't find penguins in the North Pole. And right before a penguin goes into the water, they'll actually release a bunch of air bubbles from their feathers to help them really speed through that water. A few other fun facts about penguins. The emperor penguin can be under water for 20 minutes at a time, so that's a long time. Emperor penguins also huddle together for warmth. Now king penguins right here, so king penguins have four layers of feathers. Your Gentoo penguins, right here, your Gentoo penguins,
can reach speeds of 22 miles per hour underwater. Now your penguins do not have teeth. They have backwards facing fleshy spines lining the inside of their mouth. So a bit different than actual teeth. They're much softer and flexible. Now once a year, penguins will go through what we call a catastrophic molt. And that's when they lose all their feathers. So molting is when, especially with invertebrates, so lobsters, crabs, they molt, which is where they kind of lose their shell and leave that behind. Uh, snakes molt, lizards molt, reptiles, they do that. They get rid of that skin. Uh, so birds do the same thing. They lose their feathers over time to get new ones, but the penguins lose them all at one time and they look kind of silly. So they'll have half old feathers, half new feathers. It looks really messy. Um, now the most endangered penguin is the New Zealand yellow-eyed penguin. All right, so let's move on to terns. So guys, this is what a tern looks like right here. There are 40 species of terns. They have about a three to four foot wingspan. And before I go much further, um, sorry, I forgot to mention this. This worksheet here, you guys can kind of do as I talk. So I already told you about number one here. I am also known as a flightless bird. I use my wings to swim. So you guys can already answer that one from the word bank here. So sorry, I forgot to mention that one, but this one can be worked on as I go through the lesson. And also guys, for this one here, I will explain it more towards the end, but I will be mentioning some of the answers to this worksheet starting now as well. Again, I'll talk more about that worksheet towards the end. All right, so let's go back to our terns. So terns, there's 40 species. They have a three to four foot wingspan depending on the type of tern. They have long bills and they're very light. They have a very streamlined body as well. As you can see, they're pretty narrow looking birds and they have a long tail. So they have a very long tail and they have narrow wings. They are found on all of the continents, and they sometimes eat insects, but mostly crustaceans and small fish. And terns are very cute. They have um, some really cool species of terns. All right, let's go to our next one. So we're gonna talk about gulls next. So terns and gulls are all related to each other. They're in the same uh, family, scientific family. So here's a gull. Um, you guys call them seagulls. So a seagull, actually, there is no such thing as a seagull. That is just a slang term. Um, there are different species of gulls. There's actually 50 species of gulls. Um, the one that you are most familiar with is probably the laughing gull. They're the really noisy ones that you see on beaches. Um, definitely don't try to feed them here on the beach. They don't need to be eating our food. They need to be eating their own food. Um, Bugs are related to terns. They have a wingspan of about three feet and they nest on the ground. They rarely venture out to sea, so they're the most well adapted to actually walking and being on land. Um, so even though they are considered a seabird, they live near the sea, that's why people do call them seagulls, um, but they are better adapted to life on land. Alrighty, so now we're gonna talk about the skimmer. So the skimmers are actually very cool little birds. Skimmers are also related to terns and gulls, so they're all in that same family. There are only three species of skimmers, okay? They have a wingspan of about 15 inches, so it's not very big at all. They were formerly known as scissor bills, so their bill is very, very narrow. It kind of looks like scissors, um, so that's why they got that name. Their lower bill, so the lower part of their mouth, is actually longer than the top, and that's why they are now called skimmers, because what they do is they'll actually skim across the surface of the water, and what that means is they'll open up the lower part of their bill, and they'll skim the, bo uh, skim the surface of the water with that lower jaw, and they'll catch little fish. Once they come into contact with a smaller fish, they'll snap that jaw shut, and that upper bill will close and connect with that fish and that's how they hunt. So they skim the water with that lower part of their bill. So that's pretty cool. All right, next we have pelicans. So guys, these guys right here, pelicans, there are eight species of them. 
they can get a wingspan of about six feet. So the white pelican is a very, very big species. Um, these are brown pelicans here. They are most easily recognized because that long mouth and that throat pouch you see there. They're actually more closely related to spoonbills and ibises. All right, the earliest pelican fossil that we found was actually from 30 million years ago. So pelicans around, a type of pelican were around from 30 million years ago. So how they hunt is they actually plunge dive for food. Um, if you've been to, to the beach, you've probably seen these guys actually dive down. It's pretty crazy what they do. It looks like I, they'd get a headache, but they definitely don't. Um, but they will fly around, search for food, and when they see it, they'll actually dive down really quickly, make a big splash, and usually they'll come up and they'll throw their head back to swallow the fish. Also, guys, um, another fun fact about pelicans is that they actually breathe through their mouth. Um, so they actually breathe through their mouth. Their nostrils aren't very good for breathing for them. All right, the next one we have are cormorants, kind of look like an anhinga. So um, a lot of you probably have seen an anhinga before. They are different though. Um, so the cormorants, there's about 40 different species of cormorant. Their wingspan is three to four feet long. All righty and they have dark feathers and a long thin hooked bill so it's kind of hard to see but the end of their bill is actually has a little hook on it they're excellent divers so they'll be diving down and you'll see them swimming around it's very cool to watch underwater they propel themselves underwater with their feet so their webbed feet that's how they help swim through some species have been found to dive to 150 feet deep um, so on average, cormorants can dive about 100 feet deep, um, but some species have actually gone 150 feet down. So that's pretty deep for a um, corm for any type of seabird, really, except the penguins. So once they are out of the water, they are known to sun their feathers. You see how this cormorant has its feathers opened up and outstretched here. So they sun their feathers here to help dry them off. So their feathers are water resistant. Um, but they will come out to help dry them off so they can help themselves fly later. Now in Asia, they've actually trained cormorants to help them fish for people. So people actually trained cormorants to fish for them. So that's also really interesting. All right, so now we have the albatross. Now the albatross is a really, really cool bird. So this is the albatross here. I'll show you this picture first because they're really fun looking birds. <laughs> There are 22 species of them. They have the longest wingspan of any bird. So their wingspan can be between 6 to 11 feet long. So the bigger albatrosses can have a wingspan of 11 feet. That's really, really big. And for those that don't know what a wingspan means, a wingspan is their, is their wings. So from tip of the wing to the other tip of the wing. So imagine a bird that when its wings are out, it's over 11 feet long. It's a really, really big bird. Now your albus birds can be 22 pounds. They actually will pair for life. So they'll actually find another albatross bird and they'll stay with that bird for life. They can coast for several hundred miles at a time. So coast is just soaring, hanging out. So they can coast for several hundred miles at a time without having to flap their wings much. That's really cool. And they can fly for years without ever having to land. So again, guys, take the moment to let that set in. An albatross can fly for years without ever having to land. That's pretty incredible. All right, so here we have the frigate bird. So the frigate bird, um, we have them a lot down here actually. There are five species of frigate birds. They have a wingspan of about seven and a half feet. They actually have the largest wingspan to body weight ratio. So your albatross birds have the largest wingspan, but your frigate birds are very, very light. So therefore, they have the largest wingspan to body weight ratio. Their feathers are actually not waterproof. So I actually have a frigate bird feather right here. Um, their feathers are not waterproof like your other seabirds. So when their feathers get wet, they actually get much heavier. And if a frigate bird were to go in the water, they would not be able to get out. 
Um, so it would actually drown because its feathers would get so heavy. So frigate birds don't go in the water and you never really see them walking on solid ground. You usually see them perched in trees, nesting in trees. Um, so again, guys, they don't land in the water, but kind of weird because frigate birds do eat fish. They eat things that live in the ocean. So what the frigate birds actually do is they will, you know, skim the water kind of like a skimmer does. Um, but another cool thing that they do that I really find fun and interesting is they'll actually steal food from their birds. So the frigate bird is actually called the pirate bird. And that's because what it'll do is when it sees another bird with food, it will actually bully that bird and will keep bullying it and bothering it until that bird will either throw up its food or give that fish away or drop the food. And then the frigate bird will eat. So the frigate bird will bully other birds so they can get their meal. Um, now the male frigate birds here have that red pouch. So like I said, birds, uh, seabirds really aren't too colorful. Um, but they will have some little bursts of color. So the male has this big red pouch here that he inflates, and that's how he tries to attract the female frigate birds. The female frigate birds have that white patch right there. All right, now we have herons and egrets. So guys, um, everyone gets really confused with herons and egrets, um, but they're actually the same for the most part. They're in the same family um, of bird. So herons and egrets are very, very closely related. Um, so it really, it's kind of hard to determine what's different. You just have to know what type of bird it is. So they can have wingspans of four to five feet. Um, there's two real main genuses of these guys. They have long necks that pull back when they're flying or like right here when he's kind of hanging out, they can pull that neck back. All right, so it looks like a le uh, like a, the letter S. They have very long legs, so these birds are what we call wading type birds. So they wade in the water. So they'll usually hang out in shallow water. Um, they have those long legs that help them stand in the water and be able to look down and fish. They have a longer type bill that they use kind of like a harpoon. So when they see something that they want to eat, they'll quickly move their head down and take a bite. So right here you have the great blue heron and here you have the white egret. All right, our final bird is going to be the kingfisher. So this kingfisher here, he's a very little bird. They only have about a wingspan of 10 inches. This is actually the belted kingfisher. There are 120 species of kingfishers. Um, this is the one that we have down here in the keys. All righty. So you can often see these on what we call watch points. So when I'm driving in these, I often see them on power lines or on a tree. And they just kind of sit and watch and kind of look around. They look like a security guard almost. And they actually build their nests horizontally. Um, so a lot of birds, you know, they build their nests in trees. They build like a horizontal tunnel-like nest. And their nests are lined with their regurgitated fish bones from their meal. So when they eat the fish and that seafood, they'll actually spit up the bones and they use those fish bones to build their nest. Most seabirds build their nests out of sticks and other things like that. Um, but these guys use bones, so that's quite interesting. So guys, seabirds are very, very important. They're bioindicators. They tell us what's going on in the ecosystems. They can help us kind of know what's happening. They also help in fishing. So like I said, in Asia, they've actually trained cormorants to fish for humans. Um, here in the Keys, a lot of people that like to go fishing, especially in the deeper water, they'll actually look for where all the birds are flying because that might help them be able to find a place to fish. So we actually rely on seabirds to help us fish for food. They teach us about flight, so they help us learn. That way we can, you know, make better planes and things like that, kites. So birds were kind of our first indicator of how flight works. They also provide nutrients to nature. Uh, down here, we have a, a lot of prop scars in our seagrass beds, which I mentioned um, a few years ago. So those prop scars are those just destroyed lines of seagrass within the seagrass beds. And what they actually do down here is they'll put little stakes up, like 
PVC pipes, little sticks, little platforms up in that prowler for birds to land on. And what happens is those birds will land on those little spots and they'll actually have a little poop, which actually provides nutrients to seagrass beds and helps the seagrass beds grow a little bit more quick. Uh, so they actually very much help in that. And seabirds create habitat for other species. But guys, just like all of our animals, there are a lot of things impacting them right now. There are a lot of threats. Um, other wild, like rats, cats, and dogs. So we'll go into the nest and destroy the nest. Um, remember, gulls, they nest on the ground. So that's a big issue there. Uh, a lot of people just destroy their nests. So when people are cutting down trees, uh, a lot of our seabirds down here will actually nest in the mangroves. And when those mangroves get destroyed, there goes all the nesting habitat. Pollution is probably one of the biggest issues that our seabirds are facing right now. Um, there's actually a really popular photo that was published and it was of a albatross that had passed away and its stomach was completely filled with plastic pieces. I've seen a lot of seabirds that also have fishing line around them. Um, I've seen seabirds that are stuck in trees that are because of the fishing line or this trash. Uh, that's a really big issue. Pollution is, in my opinion, probably one of the bigger issues facing our seabirds. Scientists actually think that every seabird in the world has a piece of plastic in its stomach. Um, invasive plants, so plants that shouldn't be there that are invading their natural area, that's a problem. Bycatch, so when people are fishing, they'll catch those seabirds too sometimes. Climate change, so think about our penguins in very cold areas um, as they lose their habitat due to climate change. That's a very, very big issue. And illegal feeding. So down here, when people fish, they fillet the fish. A lot of times the pelicans will hang out and watch them, want some handouts. And people will actually feed that fish carcass, so the fish bones, to the pelican. Unfortunately, when that happens, it actually tears up that pelican's neck pouch and, complete, and puts a big hole in it. Um, and then they can no longer use that neck pouch and that pelican's probably not going to survive much longer. Um, so that's a very, very big problem as well as feeding these birds. Never ever feed the birds. They need to be eating their own diet. Just like don't feed ducks and swans. Don't feed them bread. That can also damage their wings. Um, don't feed the birds. Let them get their food naturally because you don't want to give them something that's going to make them sick because we definitely need seabirds. All right, guys. So um, hopefully you guys have all the answers to this. If not, when I'm done with the video, you can go back and look at them as well. I want to talk a little bit about this worksheet here. Again, if you don't have it, that's totally fine. But what you're going to do is you're going to measure your own wingspan. So get a tape measure or get um, something that you can help measure yourself with or make a little estimation. So you're going to measure your wingspan. So you're going to outstretch your arms. So from one arm to the other, it's kind of hard to see, but you'll measure from fingertip to fingertip. And that's gonna be kind of keeping level. I'm not doing a good job of it, but that's gonna be your wingspan. For most people, your wingspan is actually gonna be very similar to your height. Um, so if you don't have a measuring tape or a, a ruler to measure your wingspan, um, just go with your height and that'll help you as well. Um, again, guys, most of us, our wingspan and our height is usually the same. If you guys know who Michael Phelps is, he's an Olympic swimmer. He actually has a longer wingspan compared to his height. People think that's why he was so good at swimming. Um, but anyway, so once you do that, you'll answer these questions here. You actually have to print this out. You can do it right online. I have the link vlog on that info section. So you'll fill out these questions here. You'll write your, arm, your wingspan here or your arm span, if you will, to make it a little easier for you guys. And you can have your partner, so maybe your parents or your sibling, you guys can compare. And then you can work on this here. So I mentioned a few of the wingspans here. I did not mention the bald eagle or the puffin. So it's your best guess. And once you kind of guess, you can look at our blog and look at the answers and you can compare. How big is your wingspan compared to an albatross? Um, again, guys, I'll help you with this one. Remember, the albatross, that wingspan is 11 feet. So that's a pretty big wingspan. So they're a bit bigger than us. Um, so those are the two worksheets there.